I learned from President Mike Herodopoulos. He led this caucus to a supermajority, and here's what he did with it. Taxes lowered, spending cut, government capped, litigation reduced, primary care expanded, Medicaid reformed, life protected, our sovereignty affirmed, our constitutional freedoms upheld, and that is the Herodopoulos legacy. Oh, and uh, one other thing, Mr. President, under your leadership, and thanks to your partnership with Speaker Cannon and with Governor Scott, Florida is the only state, the only state in America that balanced its budget without raising taxes or fees on its citizens by one single penny. Thank you for that, Mr. President. Oh! Of course, I do not for a moment underrate the great difficulties that still lie ahead of us. Unemployment is the measure of our misery. Unemployment and underemployment is the root of foreclosures and business failures. It's the cause of rising Medicaid rolls and homelessness and falling resources for our schools and our hospitals. Unemployment is the ill wind that parches the souls of our families with despair. And like you, I wonder, where will the answers come from? Every now and then I get tripped up in my grammar and in some speeches I would say, Washington is broken. And in other speeches I would say, Washington is broke. Well, it turns out both are true. <laughs> Either way, the line gets applause, but it never gets results. But you know, this isn't Washington, and I'm tired of waiting for Washington. This is our state. These are our obligations, our opportunities. This is our time to fix our own future. I think of the people who stood where I'm standing now. From this very spot, some of Florida's greatest leaders shaped the future and defined what our state was to become. And each of you, each of you in this room carries with you the scars and the lessons of lives fully lived. Your experiences, painful and pleasant, guide your interests, inform your positions, and shape your values. I look back across my own life and see moments of wrenching change that brought me to my knees and altered my world. And I beg your indulgence to speak briefly about just one of those moments, not because I want to talk about myself, but because we're on a journey together, you and I, and in fairness, you should know my coordinates and my compass heading. I did grow up in that small North Dakota town that you saw in the video, and let me put it this way, despite its many charms, we never had to run double shifts to handle the spring break crowd. <laughs> it was a windswept prairie town tucked up next to the Canadian border, and life was often cold and always hard. North Dakota was tough, but my old man was tougher. I remember him as just this incredibly strong, self-possessed person. He did work three jobs to make ends meet, but his obligation to his community was always equal to his obligation to his family. He hated bigotry, loved Barry Goldwater, sat high on the saddle, was a crack shot, and for him there was right and there was wrong. He became our mayor, honored as the best mayor in the state. He was slated to run for lieutenant governor, and he went to the nominating convention to make his speech, perhaps take his place on the ticket. I was 16 years old. I admit, I played hooky from school that day so I could watch my dad on TV. My heart swelled when I saw him give his speech, and he got thunderous applause, and I saw him wade into the outstretched hands and the smiling faces, and then on that black and white TV screen, I saw him fall and never rise again. He died at what should have been his greatest moment. On that darkest of days for me, 
My father laid down his three jobs, and I picked up three jobs. I sold clothes in a men's store during the day. I managed the movie theater at night. And on the weekends, I was the printer's devil. That's just a fancy name for janitor at the local newspaper. I took those jobs to help support my mom and two very little brothers. And I suppose to a great extent, from that day forward, my life has been spent doing the work that my dad would never finish. His death, so long ago but still so searing for me, was one of those moments when the world tilts and it never fully corrects. But small moments of clarity have their power, too. As mentioned in the video, and it bears repeating, the small high school in my town did have a sign over the door. I passed under that sign every day. It read, no place worse than second place. And for a long time, I sure didn't understand what that sign meant. No place worse than second place. For a high school kid in North Dakota, I can think of lots of places worse than second place. Like third place. Like South Dakota. <laughs> but here's what that battered sign really means. It means that if you're in fifth or sixth or seventh place, you probably never really had a shot. And if you lost, maybe it wasn't completely your fault. But if you're in second place, maybe with just a little more sweat, a few more tears, a bit more toil, you could be first. It means that if you want to be first, you need to push out the boundaries of what other people think is impossible. That sign means that odds are a barrier to overcome. They're not a barrier to entry. If you're in second place, you have failed yourself, and there's nothing worse than that. It's a lesson that propelled our little school to lots of victories and lots of different sports and activities, victories that belonged really to somebody else. No place worse than second place. I think we can use that truth today in this chamber and in this state. We all love Florida and we're not alone. 75 million tourists who love Florida visited here last year. More than 18 million people live here and more are coming despite the hurricanes, despite citizens insurance, despite redistricting. Florida. Florida has the most beautiful beaches, fantastic weather, amazing cities, welcoming people, great universities, and low taxes. And so my question is not rhetorical. Who would not want to be here? The answer, sadly, is that while lots of Fortune 500 CEOs live here, most Fortune 500 companies do not want to be here. Every Fortune 100 company does not want to be here. New York, with its numbingly cold winters and oppressively a massive tax structure, has 18 Fortune 100 companies. California, reduced to paying its bills with IOUs, has 13. Florida has none. None. We are the most attractive state of this country, yet we are not attracting the full range of businesses. We're not even in the first tier of states where companies settle to create thousands and thousands of high-paying jobs. At best, at best, we're in the second tier. And there's no place worse than second place. And so the cause to which we are called today is to make Florida first. The first place to create a business idea. The first place to start a business in an incubator, even in a garage. The first place to expand a going business. The first place to relocate a business. For it is only when an entrepreneur reaches for a risk that opportunities for workers are created and that unemployment and underemployment give way to real jobs in a real economy. And so, as I was forced by fate to take three jobs on a grim day long ago, there are three jobs that I ask you to join me in accepting today in order to make Florida first. Now, you don't have to run the projector for the late movie or sweep out the newspaper shop. Our first job in the Senate and in state government and in our party is to behave in a way that reflects the goodness of the people who sent us here. Floridians are smart. They know that sprawling, expensive government has failed them. 
but they also understand that when we do nothing except posture and bicker, then nothing gets done, and we leave the field to the bureaucrats whose absurd rules stifle innovation and smother progress. As President Atwater reminded us in his eloquent farewell speech on this floor, never fear the debate, but let the debate be mature and constructive. Given the task before us and the talent in this room, and I mean the governor and the House and the Senate, I mean Republicans and Democrats, there is nothing to keep this legislature from being the most effective deliberative body in America. So let us begin by setting the highest ethical standards and let us here live by the standards we set. Let there never again be a time when the people of Florida are ashamed of their political leaders.